Uh, thank you so much, um, Guy Alba. It's uh, very impressive to see um, what you've accomplished with this um, online meeting and translating into so many different languages, um, showing that despite a pandemic, um, progress can be made. And um, I've also made that the theme of my uh, brief update here on X-linked ALD, um, that despite the challenges that we've faced in the past year, uh, there has been also tremendous progress and opportunities for growth. And um, as you said, some things have been difficult and delayed, but uh, there have been other opportunities in terms of um, virtual meetings and virtual uh, clinic visits and abilities to uh, collaborate across the world. So um, I'm just going to briefly introduce the agenda for today. Um, there's been a um, small change in that uh, Josh Bunkowski uh, from Utah will speak before Johannes Berger uh, as he has some uh, travel commitments. Um, and uh, then we will go on to hear uh, Stefan Kemp uh, speak, and then uh, Caroline Sevin um, and Wolfgang Kula. You can see that we're really covering a tremendous amount of ground here uh, across various different aspects of adrenal leukodystrophy. Um, and also bringing experts together from all over the world. Um, and I think this is really in the spirit of what ELA International has done, which is to be a global resource and a place where people can meet from across the world, not just patients, but also clinicians and scientists. So I will not uh, dwell all that much on things that will be discussed by others, um, but I will um, try to give an overview and also mention some things that might, may not be covered by um, uh, some of the speakers in the next two hours. So what progress have we witnessed in the past year or two? I think it's very exciting to see newborn screening and early detection expand not only in the United States, but also in the Netherlands, and I hope um, in future countries as well. This gives us a chance really to identify patients early and monitor them and then treat them more effectively. An example of this is ex vivo gene therapy, which you will hear about uh, from Caroline Semer later. Um, uh, and uh, that has treated more than 50 children. Um, maybe slight correction, I think she's going to be speaking on some of the experiences with MIN 102, but she's an active part of the ex vivo gene therapy trial as well. So the fact that more than 50 children have been treated with gene therapy really puts this. Um, treatment in ALD and, and at the forefront of gene therapy. Um, an international monitor center trial for AMN has just been completed. Wolfgang Kula will speak on that. Trial readiness um, for leukodystrophies and AMN is being spearheaded in the US by a group called uh, the GLIA um, Clinical Trials Network. You will be hearing uh, by, from Stefan Kemp on a new approach to adrenal leukodystrophy, very exciting, that exploits our understanding of how uh, the particular lipids that accumulate in ALD can be manipulated so uh, that they change uh, their toxic function. I will then uh, shift into some uh, descriptions of first papers on 
bowel and bladder dysfunction in adults with ALD. I think a very neglected aspect of the disease that has not been addressed in many decades um, and really needs to be highlighted also to regulatory agencies and the kinds of um, organizations that approve drugs. Um, I'm, I'm particularly happy that uh, ELA was able to host the first scientific meeting on women with ALD. And I think this is a really growing area in the field of ALD and AMN. And uh, ELA launched the first grant funding for trials in women with ALD. So I think there's a lot that's going to occur in, in this new area. So what is adrenal leukodystrophy? Some of you might be new to uh, the disease and to uh, this meeting. And I will briefly tell you how we define this disease and how it manifests. On the left side, you see a schematic of a cell. And then within that cell, you can see different parts like the nucleus, mitochondria. These are different um, organelles, different parts of the cell. And there's one part of the cell that's important in ALD, and that is the peroxisome. And the particular uh, gene that is defective in ALD encodes a protein that sits on the surface of this organelle, this peroxisome. And the peroxisome acts as a disposal, as a garbage can where certain lipids are being disposed of. And if this protein on the surface is not functioning well, the lipids do not get into this peroxisome and cannot be degraded. And these particular lipids are very long chain fatty acids, as most of you know. So once you have a gene defect in this particular um, gene, and I mentioned here below that this gene is called ABCD1, that as I said, encodes this transmembrane protein, then you can have various different manifestations. In childhood, the between the ages of four and 10, you have about 30, 40% likelihood of developing a brain disease called cerebral ALD. If that doesn't occur, you usually develop well, you go into adulthood and you develop something uh, we call adrenomyeloneuropathy, um, which is a disease not of the brain, but of the spinal cord. Important to mention that beyond the nervous system, the other organ system that's also affected is the adrenal gland. And starting in childhood, you are at risk of developing adrenal insufficiency. This is a very important part of the disease, but luckily there is a way of replacing a missing hormone um, and ensuring um, compensated function of the adrenal gland. I should mention here that there's an ongoing debate on um, how to define and how to call um, uh, women who are affected by ALD. Um, and uh, this slide is actually already outdated. We are using terms uh, in the US of uh, either uh, women being symptomatic or uh, asymptomatic with ALD. And, um, and hence we're not using the term AMN. One more point to make here quickly is that uh, while ABCD1 is the disease causing gene, it's important to note that there is another gene called ABCD2 that encodes a similar protein and is 66% identical at the amino acid level. And you will see later why 
this is important. So I want to start with newborn screening, very exciting, as I mentioned, the fact that this is rolling out across the US and now more than half of the population in the United States is being uh, screened for at birth. And we're finding many, many um, newborns that are identified in early stages and then allow for monitoring both of their adrenal function as well as of the brain function by MRI. A shout out here to Stefan Kemp and his team in Amsterdam who have accomplished this newborn screening also in the Netherlands. And this is uh, something I think that will be very successful. A quick overview of the current and emerging treatments for adrenal leukodystrophy uh, beyond corticosteroids for the adrenal insufficiency, we have bone marrow transplant, ex vivo gene therapy for cerebral ALD, some uh, treatments you're gonna hear about today um, and um, several treatments in the pipeline. It's an exciting time uh, for adrenal leukodystrophy. I think as mentioned before, there's still a relative lack of treatment trials for women but I think ELA International and many others are starting to work on this and there's gonna be progress in the coming years. Clearly under COVID-19, there was a lot of, there have been a lot of challenges and there was a lot of delays as mentioned before, but also adaptation. And we learned a lot about how to adapt some of the uh, trials and uh, use remote um, monitoring visits, adapt, shipping of drug to patients in order to keep some of the trials going. I think a big success that you'll hear about by uh, from Wolfgang Kula has been the MIN-102 trial of a pioglitazone metabolite. Pioglitazone is an, a, a well-known medication that has been used for many years for diabetes. And this is uh, a derivative of this medication that uh, helps an AMN by reducing oxidative, oxidative stress and mitochondrial function. Um, I want to point out here that this was really a worldwide effort across many uh, centers in Europe and the US, a nice collaboration between industry and uh, academia. So what is missing in the field? Where do we go from here? We know the gene defect can be identified after newborn screening at birth. We know of a, a phase of where cerebral ALD can occur in childhood. Uh, we know how to uh, stop it if we catch it early. We know that we are uh, conducting first trials in adrenal myelinopathy, but we are still lacking good trials for adults with cerebral ALD. We need to do more of that. Um, we need to understand how we can uh, address um, 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 more of the symptomatic phases of the disease. For women, uh, there is really uh, right now, um, apart from symptomatic management, very little to address the root cause of disease. We are understanding that uh, many women develop myelopathy similar to men, but there are also differences in terms of certain kinds of movement disorders, the prevalence of pain um, and other symptoms. So briefly to mention the ex vivo lentiviral gene therapy trial uh, for childhood cerebral ALD that has now enrolled over 50 patients um, and is hopefully going to um, be reviewed by the European Medical Agency uh, this year and hopefully at the FDA the year thereafter. This treatment is based on taking bone marrow cells from the boys themselves, uh, correcting them in a dish with uh, this antiviral vector that puts the correct um, gene back and then delivers these cells to the boys after some chemotherapy. And these boys have been followed and the vast majority of these boys have either remained 
uh, asymptomatic or um, stabilized. And uh, so I think this is really an important uh, treatment modality that is similar to what happens with bone marrow transplantation, but uh, with the advantage that you don't experience graft versus host or engraftment problems. There's still need to follow this treatment closely um, as it's experimental and we uh, still understand little of how uh, this kind of gene manipulation affects uh, the genome, but so far uh, results are encouraging. One of the uh, recent insights has been that we can directly observe in the brain that the microvascular perfusion, the blood flow in the brain uh, improves after uh, giving ex vivo gene therapy. Uh, for childhood cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy. This has been something that we have in the past very crudely monitored with something called contrast enhancement or gadolinium. And now we have newer tools where we can look at the small capillaries and measure uh, uh, the blood flow in the brain directly. So this is work that will uh, be coming out by Patricia Mussolino uh, shortly. New treatments for cerebral ALD are emerging that are looking at other cells from the bone marrow, uh, not just the types of cells I just uh, mentioned before, but um, uh, Troy Lund has looked at mesenchymal stem cells, a particular kind of stem cell from the bone marrow that can um, change into various different uh, types of cells. And uh, in his first experience, this seems to have uh, an ability to decrease inflammation uh, in the brain. And um, Troy Lund has uh, applied this to a few patients uh, to date. It seems to be safe but it still needs to be optimized in order to be effective. So far, we have not seen this treatment to be efficacious uh, for patients with uh, a, a cerebral ALD. And we're still wondering why that is, given that it can improve inflammation. And it might be the timing, the dosing, the choice of patient selected. So there's a lot of ongoing work here. You will hear uh, more about uh, work on uh, upregulating ABCD2 um, by various different modalities. One of them here uh, mentioned uh, is by Johannes Berger, who will be speaking in this session. He has um, employed something called HDAC inhibitors. This is a class of compounds that can manipulate uh, gene expression, in particular, uh, help upregulate ABCD2. As I mentioned before, this is a um, protein very similar to that faulty ABCD1 that we see in ALD. And uh, he has examined this very closely in a particular cell type uh, called a macrophage that plays a big role in the inflammation in ALD. Johannes Berger has also um, spent a lot of time uh, studying biomarkers in ALD and will be reporting on that. Uh, uh, the group in Amsterdam has similarly uh, examined biomarkers uh, such as neurofilament light chain. Uh, these are uh, the kinds of markers that tell us how uh, the neuronal cells, the brain cells are doing this has been something that's very hard to assess uh, because we don't have direct access to the brain. But in blood, we are now can uh, measure these markers uh, that give us an, a direct uh, assessment of uh, the health of certain uh, brain cells by looking at markers such as a neurofilament light chain. I mentioned before, there are various different compounds that can upregulate ABCD2. And one of the 
more recent compounds that are being looked at are um, are thyromimetics. These are uh, medications that act or have a similar effect to thyroid hormones. And uh, Tom Scanlon has spent many years uh, studying these kinds of compounds for ALD. And he more recently has improved upon um, the compounds he has used in the past and has now a new drug uh, uh, subiterone pro drug AM2 that is now going to be coming into trials uh, with the help of a company called Autobahn. So I think these are um, uh, exciting times where we're hoping that uh, these different kinds of approaches are going to have synergistic additive benefit for patients. Um, I have uh, been advancing over the past decade, a particular gene therapy for the spinal cord of patients with AMN. And just to briefly highlight uh, that this type of gene therapy is different from what is being used in children uh, with ALD. This is a, a, um, a gene therapy that it, it is, does not rely on take, taking out cells from the bone marrow to correct the gene, but here the gene is directly delivered into uh, the intrathecal space of the spinal cord. And this uh, intrathecal gene delivery happens with a certain viral vector called AAV, okay? And this AAV vector we've been able to um, test in mouse models, and uh, we are able to show that we get into the right cell types, and we also are, uh, can lower the very long chain fatty acids that accumulate in ALD. In order to um, execute trials, we know we need to know what we're going to measure in patients and beyond uh, the ability to walk, we are paying now um, more and more attention to patients' ability to balance. And uh, Mark Engelin has done some wonderful work looking at body sway as a measure of spinal cord health. We have built on that and are uh, looking at various ways in which um, patients' uh, balance and posture uh, can be studied by uh, shifting the surface under the patients or changing their visual environment. And we think that these kinds of uh, measures will be very helpful in finding uh, uh, drugs earlier uh, that can help uh, this balance and posture function. As I mentioned before, we understand now that women have uh, also different disorders then men, there are similarities in terms of uh, some uh, uh, gait and balance problems, but they also have uh, differences in terms of their um, movement. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, we see uh, a lot of women who have changes in their head position, neck position, um, and also uh, the complaints of pain, which can be quite varied in women with ALD. Um, so these can range from pain due to joint pain, nerve pain. But what we've in particular become interested in is a type of uh, discomfort that keeps women up at night uh, uh, due to restless leg syndrome. And uh, this is a, a nice collaboration with um, uh, experts in the field, such as John Winkleman, Newton Sharma, who uh, in the field of RLS and, and movement uh, at Harvard have uh, been very valuable collaborators. So we expect more to come. We also know that uh, bowel and bladder problems are in women, um, as common as in men with ALD, albeit uh, they manifest at a slightly 
later age. And you can see here the age prevalence in uh, close to 100 patients that we evaluated at Mass General. Uh, in men, this occurs slightly earlier. In women, uh, around their 40s and 50s. And you can see that more than 60% of women um, experience urinary urgency, urinary incontinence, and also uh, fecal urgency. P problems with um, bowel control are quite prevalent. So what are the gaps that we are closing? What are we missing? Um, I think we need to work on guidelines for uh, standardizing care, for monitoring after newborn screening. We need to uh, address disparities in access to diagnosis and treatment. Now that we're starting to have few treatments that are working, that are about to be approved, how do we understand that everybody is able to get access to these treatments? Um, can we get regulatory engagement from FDA, from EMA, so we can move forward more quickly and incentivize new treatments and trials. And I think the uh, part of this is being addressed in uh, an international consensus um, uh, group that is um, putting together uh, uh, guidelines uh, across uh, uh, different uh, centers of excellence. We know that um, standardization of biomarker work and MRIs and wearable technology is important. I think ELA has really led the way with um, incentivizing new treatment trials by, um, by their recent funding announcement for women. So a big credit to them there. Um, I think in the coming years, we'll have to really understand how to roll out uh, treatments so that um, they can address patients across the uh, entire uh, social and racial um, divide. We need to, uh, particularly in the US, understand how uh, disparities according to um, economics and, and uh, social and racial disparities affect healthcare. And over the past year during the pandemic, we've been particularly aware that uh, these disparities of, uh, uh, in, in, in these realms are affecting um, and, uh, patients and augmenting these uh, differences in healthcare. Um, but I think in the end, we've seen a lot to be hopeful for, and that amidst uh, the disease and the pandemic, the powers of families has really prevailed. And I continue to be inspired by many of the families that have gone through so much and have yet uh, shown tremendous courage to help each other and, and support each other and raise to disease awareness together, educate the public, educate uh, physicians, but also help each other in times of crisis. And uh, I, I'm, I think this is a wonderful forum to continue that work. So thank you. I think we will, um, take questions at the end. And uh, it is now my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Josh Bunkowski uh, from the University of Utah, uh, who uh, will be speaking next. And he Hi, is, uh, can you hear me, Josh? Yep, yep. thanks, Florian. Okay, perfect. And let's see if I can make this work. And thanks for the opportunity to present today. And thanks uh, to the other speakers for letting me go out of order. Um, we are trying to get ready for a trip. And so we're just um, getting everything all set up right now. So it's, uh, it's exciting to be speaking at ELA. Um, 
I've uh, really benefited from the involvement, uh, as you'll hear a little bit later today uh, with Stefan Kemp. Uh, we've been able to participate in some work that was facilitated by the fact that we were all able to meet together in uh, Luxembourg a few years ago, back in the pre-pandemic days. And then in the talk I'll be giving here, it's another collaboration where the chance to interact with other folks uh, is really key. So uh, for a while, I know Ayla had as its spokesperson uh, Zinedine Zidane. Uh, and uh, you know, I think of uh, Ayla as the playmaker for lots of things going on in adrenal leukodystrophy. So today I'll be talking about uh, new, insight, new insights into cerebral ALD. So just some disclosure with grant support, philanthropic support, um, clinical trial involvement, some consulting work, uh, stock and board of directors. So the talk is broken into three parts. In the first, I'll give a brief introduction to the concept of using uh, big data. In the second part, I will talk about the difficulty that we all face in understanding uh, cerebral ALD, and that understanding is really critical for how we improve treatment for it. And then in the third, third part, I'll try and give some new insights that we've worked on uh, under, to understanding cerebral ALD and hopefully uh, ways to address it. So uh, I wanted to introduce the concept of big data and little fish to you all. And so this is a picture of a big number and a little fish. So what is big data? So we've heard the term a lot in the media. It's the concept of using large data sources to reveal unknown or unexpected aspects of disease or of health. Um, one problem is that because uh, patients with rare diseases such as um, ALD uh, aren't, uh, there aren't a lot of people. It just means that they are less represented in the healthcare system, so there's less data out there about them. But by trying to accumulate data across countries or across multiple centers, uh, it's possible to uh, generate large data sets. So some single centers, because of the passage of time, have accumulated large data sets, or uh, many countries or hospital systems have built uh, databases Sometimes they've done it uh, for reasons more financial, uh, but these data sets then have uh, information for us, the healthcare researchers, to understand health and disease uh, for people. So for ALD, um, prior to 2015, it was very difficult to do any research into ALD across the United States. So it did not have a separate um, diagnostic listing, what's called an ICD nine code, which meant that we didn't know if we saw a patient with a leukodystrophy in the database, or were we looking at ALD or MLD or Canavans, we just had no idea. So then in September 2015, a new coding system called the ICD-10 code system was created. And now ALD has a unique code uh, for tracking people in databases. One limitation is that the code, we can't really distinguish who has ALD or AMN or CALD, cerebral ALD. There's various tricks that we can use to get around that, but it's still not as, um, you know, not as granular as we wish. And then, although we have pretty good, um, we've done various validation steps, we don't really know how accurate the code use is uh, across centers. So in the United States, there's really one or two large data sets that are used. One is called FIS, and this represents children's hospitals. Um, and then KID is a sampling method. And it's representative of the of entire United States, but it's a sampling method. So of course, with any kind of sampling and statistics, it makes you nervous if there's issues around the sampling. So FIS was generated by um, the Children's Hospital Association. It was it actually originally developed because they were trying to track their um, costs of things like supplies. But now it's a, you know, a huge database with more than 50 children's hospitals. And so there's you know, more than 50 children's hospitals, more than 2.2 million inpatient days, uh, more than $90 billion of costs um, have collected in the system. So just a huge amount of information so that even with a rare disease, it lets us look at uh, what's going on. So this gets us then kind of to the second part of the talk, which is trying to understand cerebral ALD. And so as we um, know, patients, even family members who have the same mutation, the same ABCD1 mutation, can have distinct phenotypes. So even twin brothers, one might develop the cerebral form, one might not. 
we've, uh, you know, despite several decades of research, we've never been able to find a second gene that seems to influence that risk. And this really suggests that there's some sort of environmental trigger or what's called an epigenetic risk that's somehow modifying whether or not someone goes on to develop cerebral ALD. Uh, interestingly, as I'll show you in a minute, cerebral ALD has features that are shared with other demyelinating diseases, such as multiple sclerosis. So it suggests that the demyelination is a kind of a final pathway. Um, so, you know, there's multiple ways to get there. Uh, you know, we're coming from the ALD point, but maybe, you know, it's maybe it's similar to the multiple sclerosis. So what is that thing that launches you down that pathway? And then, of course, with cerebral ALD, um, we're really dependent upon making a diagnosis quickly um, in order to prevent the disease. And so that's obviously not an ideal situation for treatment. So this is work uh, from Florian Eichler and others uh, back from 2008, just showing that the demyelination cerebral ALD has a robust inflammatory response. So meaning that the, it's the inflammation, it's this kind of um, aberrant immune response that's causing um, the lesion in ALD. And that's very similar to what's happening in diseases such as multiple sclerosis. So because of this, there's kind of been this uh, uh, running hypothesis in the field of ALD that um, there's a shared um, risk in ALD as there might be in something like multiple sclerosis. And so uh, low vitamin D levels is a known risk factor for multiple sclerosis. And so there's been um, thoughts, not from me originally, but from many others, that low vitamin D status is a risk factor for, for cerebral demyelination in ALD. So this is work uh, coming from Keith Van Heron and other people that he's collaborated with over the years, where he has now um, done a large study. So I'm presenting basically for the next several slides, his work and the work from his group, looking at the risk of cerebral ALD and low vitamin D levels. So this is a, a retrospective analysis of patients who are collected at two centers um, from Kennedy Krieger Institute and from INSERM in Paris. And so 24 patients total. And um, they basically looked over time to see which patients developed cerebral ALD and which didn't. And, um, and they basically were very similar in terms of their um, age, um, of course, they had different ages at the end point because of the disease process. Um, and they also had very similar, uh, very long chain fatty acid profiles. So there weren't any differences at baseline between the two groups when they started. However, um, when we went back and analyzed the plasma samples, what they found is that in the patients who developed cerebral ALD, that they, um, right, shown here on the left, these kind of orangish dots, that they had lower serum vitamin D levels compared to patients who did not develop cerebral ALD. They did a couple of different statistical analyses just to make sure that they weren't seeing a sort of a fluke in the data since it is a small data set. And they found that for every you know, uh, higher level of vitamin D in the serum that the risk of cerebral ALD was lower. And they did this with two different statistical methods. So of course, this was a, you know, this is, or this was a very small sample size and a small number of samples. And I know that, uh, you know, Keith, hopefully in the next half year, we'll have a nice uh, data to kind of look at this uh, more rigorously uh, in, the, in the patient cohort. But this made us think, you know, I've heard uh, Keith talk now several times, can we use big data to help us to understand cerebral ALD and the epidemiological risk, including for vitamin D? And so, one of the big things that is known for multiple sclerosis is that there is this north-south gradient of disease. So basically, the farther you are from the equator, whether it's going into the northerly latitudes, up into the United States and Canada or northern Europe, or if you're going into the more southerly latitudes, like New Zealand or southern Australia, that your risk of multiple sclerosis uh, increases. And that's believed to be related to perhaps vitamin D levels. So our question was, could we look and see whether there's a north-south gradient of cerebral ALD? So the first thing we did is we looked across um, cerebral ALD across the entire United States to make sure there weren't other factors that could be contributing. So we didn't find any differences in the risk for cerebral ALD by race, 
by how far people live from the hospital, whether they are urban or rural, what the household income was, or what their insurance type was. So for example, maybe you, know, you could imagine going into the study that maybe somehow living on a farm and being exposed to certain you know, bacteria viruses might, uh, maybe that would um, desensitize your immune system, maybe your risk would be lower. But we did not see anything like that. So there's none of these factors had any risks, uh, didn't contribute to the risk for cerebral ALD. But then we looked across the country and we looked at the relative risk of cerebral LD relative to the total number of patients. And so it's a little bit, you look at this uh, data and there's not really a clear pattern, but so what we did is we could then actually map it out by zip code, uh, which are the kind of the um, kind of kind of postal areas across the country. We found that with uh, each um, two degrees more north that someone lives in the United States, that the um, risk of developing cerebral ALD rises. And this is uh, statistically significant. And so that first uh, set of data um, with the analysis of cerebral ALD by North-South Gradient and also uh, Keith Van Heeren's work, we're hoping to, uh, to get published this year. It's been a little bit slow coming out, but we hope to have those papers out this, this year in 2021. So of course, um, we're very excited about this, but it doesn't really help us understand mechanistically what's going on with cerebral ALD. And the big problem in the field has been that there hasn't been a great animal model for understanding it. And that's something we've been working on. And so we've been using a, a, a vertebrate animal called the zebrafish. And this is a picture of an adult zebrafish. And zebrafish, uh, we use them for many reasons. Um, they are very inexpensive and we can generate large numbers of animals. and so. On any given day for an experiment, I can analyze many thousand animals, um, which is a um, you know huge value for scientific experiments. They also share the same biology that we do. They're vertebrates. They have the same genes. They develop quickly, so we're not waiting a long time for experiments. And as I mentioned before, they are inexpensive. So back in 2017, we published on the zebrafish ALD model, um, which just these are just some examples of the data from that information. Um, we find elevated very long chain fatty acid levels. They have demyelination in the spinal cord. So they have the same characteristics of um, ALD as found in human patients. Over the past uh, year and a half now, uh, a postdoc together with a talented undergraduate, so Quentin Ross, the postdoc, um, have been trying and succeeding, I'd say, with a zebrafish cerebral ALD model. And basically the concept they, they took was, could they use a two hit um, trigger for causing demyelination? So basically um, at seven days of life, they um, expose the animals to a combination of LPS plus uh, cuprazone. And then within uh, two days, they can look to see if a demyelination event is occurring. And so what they found, uh, the simplest test was to, to look at motor behavior, so impaired motor behavior. And zebrafish, of course, we use swimming. And we have uh, an automated tracking system. And this is an example of the data we can get from automated tracking. Each blue area here is where the zebrafish movement has been tracked. And then we can compare how do the wild type fish do, which are these black dots here, compared to the zebrafish um, ALD mutants. And so there's a disproportionate effect of the cuprazone plus LPS on the zebrafish uh, who have ALD. And that's shown in this far right uh, box compared to this um, box right here. And so having the ABCD1 mutation makes these fish uh, extraordinarily sensitive to the inflammatory hit from LPS plus cuprazone. We also then looked at the inflammatory genes that mark an inflammatory response. And I've pointed out <laughs> the date of interest. And so these are a couple of different markers, uh, NOS2A and IL1B, showing again that the mutants, the ABCD1 mutants, have a disproportionate inflammatory response to the LPS plus cuprazone hit. Uh, as a compensation, it looks like the animals do try and upregulate um, expression of myelin transcripts. So we looked at a couple of different uh, myelin transcripts. MPZ is a zebrafish homolog of P0. Um, and so we see that in the mutants, uh, with this kind of clear bar on the right of each group, that the mutants are 
an increasing transcript level because with the with the loss of the myelin, they're trying to compensate and uh, remake myelin um, that's being lost. So with our hypothesis, of course, we predict that if our hypothesis about the reason for vitamin D uh, being a problem, we should see a worsening uh, in the zebrafish model using vitamin D antagonists. And so we have tried now to see if using vitamin D antagonists would worsen the phenotype in our zebrafish model. And so this is a uh, vitamin D antagonist called ZK. And um, the wild type fish are shown in kind of the light gray, and the um, mutants are shown with the smaller black dots. And with, hot, with treatment, even with very low doses of the vitamin D antagonists, we see a um, disproportionate loss of the ability, ability uh, to swim uh, with their motor movement. And again, showing that there's something going on with how vitamin D interacts with pathways uh, that's affecting the zebrafish um, in their swimming ability. So, of course, this is just with one antagonist. We also want to see, can we rescue behavior using agonists, things that activate vitamin D? Uh, can we see with other antagonists? And so we're looking both at the motor behavior of the animals, as well as looking at um, expression um, by QRT-PCR or RNA-seq to see what are the gene level changes that are uh, causing this, um, this kind of effect on development. So um, with this model of cerebral ALD, which is being supported by ALA, so that's um, a you know, big thanks to ALA, um, we're trying to complete the kind of characterization of the model, so kind of a complete description of the inflammatory, uh, inflammatory response, what's happening to all good endocytes, what's happening to myelin. Um, at the you know, mechanistic level, we need to see what are the gene changes that are driving that. And so I think using RNA-seq is gonna be our, our ticket to understanding how this is all happening. Um, we really are curious, like what is vitamin D doing at the genetic or epigenetic level to cause these changes? And we're um, looking into something called the inflammasome um, to see if that's mediating the effects of this disease. So the two conclusions are, that um, cerebral ALD and its distribution geographically suggests similar mechanisms to multiple sclerosis uh, and there's potential roles for vitamin D. And then with a new zebrafish model, cerebral ALD, we think we have a chance to understand um, pathophysiology. Uh, lots of people to thank and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Josh. Very, very exciting. To, uh, and now, now I always look at the little pencil tip and think of your zebrafish. Um, we, uh, we next have uh, Johannes Berger. And, um, and as he's getting ready, just a, a brief shout out to uh, Ila to have also supported this work, both of Dr. Bunkowski and Dr. Berger um, to make this all possible. Johannes? <coughs> And just for all panelists, we um, unfortunately have to limit our time to 15 minutes each, okay. So, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So, I will speak, so first of all, also thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to present the data here today. So, I will speak on the, on the need for the monitoring of brain integrity using blood-derived biomarkers. So. so I will leave once more, I'm sorry. I have to share again. Somehow this didn't, um, So, 
Johannes, I think you have to use the arrows on your keyboard when you yes, have the laser I, pointer. Now it's going, yeah. Okay, it was somehow blocked. So uh, as Florian Eichler already has mentioned, uh, so I don't want to go into detail. You all know that uh, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy can present clinically very heterogeneous. Uh, and so I will focus on the uh, cerebral form of XALD today. And as you do know, the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, or as Florian Eichler has uh, told you before, also the gene therapy can halt the inflammatory demyelination within these boys. So we thought, and in particular as for patients which are too late for a bone marrow transplantation uh, or for patients who might not be able to undergo a bone marrow transplantation, uh, a pharmacological approach to halt this demyelinating um, uh, inflammation would be very, very uh, important. Uh, so many companies also had, uh, and, and uh, many attempts are currently ongoing to this. And uh, we have used, as Florian has said, uh, this approach uh, with these HDEC inhibitors. And we indeed, when investigating the uh, cerebral spinal fluid and compared markers uh, then with the blood markers, we could clearly demonstrate that there was a closure of the blood uh, brain barrier, so a, a halt of the inflammation. However, it seems to be temporarily, and the patients uh, involved, the fathers immediately say, uh, actually, does this mean now that also the uh, demyelination has immediately stopped? Or what's about the uh, axonal degeneration? And so, of course, we would love to answer these questions. What's what, what was at the very moment uh, for other cell types and for the other pathology within the brain. But of course, we don't know. So we set out and uh, here, this was also uh, funded uh, by ELA in 2018. But we realized in this study, of course, how important uh, it is to continuously monitor uh, the integrity of cell types within the brain. So we tried to identify blood-derived markers to monitor the success of the treatment. A readout of what is ongoing in the brain at the very moment. So, and this project was also funded by ELA. So I would like to step back uh, a little bit and uh, inform you that within our brain, uh, of course, we have these oligodendroglier cells uh, who, which myelinate the axons and of the, of the neurons here in blue, we have all this neuronal network, uh, but we also have other cell types with uh, utmost important like the astrocytes, uh, who are buffering the entire system and supporting with nutrition uh, to the uh, neurons. And we have the microglia cells, uh, which are so important also for the uh, central nervous system. So as you do know, as we are in, in ELA, the leukodystrophy association, the primary defect in Alexander's disease, for example, are in astrocytes and it leads to a demyelination for Pelizeus Merzbacher disease, for example, the primary defect is in uh, myelin proteins uh, and lead to demyelination in XLD or MLD or others. It lies again in this demyelination directly in the, in the affecting uh, oligodendroglier cells and very much also the microglia. So we do see that all these cell types do affect, of course, uh, the demyelination. And when we look more closely in ALD, of course, the oligodendroglier cells, they do die. And of course, we have this activation and this inflammatory demyelination. But what we clearly also see is astrocyte activation. And most importantly, we do see 
the neural cell death and the axonal defect, which finally at the end lead to the defect uh, in, in the, the final uh, impairment uh, within the patients. So with this in mind, we started to focus first on the neurons and try to find a way whether it's possible to investigate the axonal integrity uh, and, and the system, the neuronal system in the central nervous system. So yes, this is possible. And while or when an axonal damage occur, neurofilaments, which is part of the cytoskeletal of this axon is getting free. This is very prominent to visualize in the central spinal fluid and can be detected by ELISA. However, uh, it's a tight monitoring uh, is very difficult uh, due to the uh, taking of the uh, central spinal fluid for many patients, uh, at many time points, this would be very difficult. And the other problem was in the blood, the number of neurofilaments they are in a very tight correlation, but they are to a less extent in the blood. So it was for a long time very difficult to measure these low amounts using ELISAs. However, modern technology enabled uh, with single molecule arrays, the digital ELISA, uh, have a method which is uh, called shortly CIMOA, which is 127 times more sensitive than the ELISA, and this gave us now the opportunity to monitor the uh, blood uh, 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 amounts of neurofilament light chain. So we did that, uh, and uh, here is also a big thank uh, to ELA Germany, uh, uh, where we also get uh, uh, for many, many years the support that patients, so Austria is a small country, there are not so many ALD patients. Uh, so uh, they, they allowed us uh, that uh, patients from Germany can come to Vienna uh, and there uh, I show them Vienna and they donate the blood to us. Uh, and it's also a very tight cooperation with Wolfgang Köhler from Leipzig, uh, with Patrick Obur from Paris and with Florian Eichler from Harvard. And together we got a very, very nicely, uh, very well characterized and very informative XLT collective uh, with uh, 94 patients and <coughs> healthy controls. So when we look now for the new filament light chain, we first had the question, do asymptomatic XLT patients have a change in this new filament light chain? And no, they don't have. When we look then on the AMN patients, they do have a clear increase. However, AMN certainly, it's a port spectrum of uh, patients. So they have different severities, of course, which can be uh, scored by the uh, probably suboptimal scoring system, which is derived from, from MS, uh, which is called the uh, EDSS scoring system. And there we saw that with each point in the EDSS scoring system, about 6% increase of neurofilament light chain uh, in the AMN patients. However, what was most strikingly, when we looked at CLD patients, these really get very highly increased. And here I would like to put your attention to the axis scaling. So we are in a logarithmic scale. So it is really, you can appreciate this strong increase uh, uh, in neurofilament light chain within these CLD patients. However, of course, again, CLD is not CLD. And it's very important uh, to see, does this also somehow correlate to the severity of the inflammatory demyelination? And this can be also scored by the LUS score. So when correlating to the LUS score, and here again, I would like to point to this logarithmic scale. And here we have the LUS score of these CLD patients. And what you can see here, that there is a very clear and nice correlation. 
But what you also can see is that there are exceptions. So you see this point and this point. So they are clearly out of this very clear correlation. So I would like to point your attention now to these three, uh, three uh, patients. So, and therefore, I just show you what usually happens. So in these patients with a normal progressive inflammatory demyelination, once the gadolinium enhancement can be visualized, you also see the strong increase in the neurofilament light chain levels. And here you also see in the numbers, they reflect the LERS score in these patients. And here you see these gray dots there, the controls, the age matrix controls. So you see this strong increase. However, in these particular patients, I just showed you before, this did not happen. So they still uh, continued to be low. And uh, also it seems that they have a somehow slowly progressive uh, form of X-linked adrenolicotrophy. So with this, we think we can explain these patients so that among all these CLD patients, there are some of them which progress much slower than the others. However, what we can do uh, is uh, we can investigate whether after gadolinium enhancement and after the treatment with the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, whether these values decrease and they do. So what's very clear that the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation not only halts the gadolinium enhancement or the, and finally also later the demyelination, but also the axonal degeneration uh, within the central nervous system. So with this measurement of neurofilament light chain uh, over the time in the blood, it will be possible to tightly monitor also upcoming uh, treatment strategies in patients which have increased NFL levels uh, in, the, in the brain. So with this, I would like to come to the conclusion. So there's a take home message. I have told you that neurofilament light chain is strongly amplified in CLD patients and reflect brain lesion severity in most of the patients. Upon hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, NFL is gradually normalized. So this together, NFL is a potential surrogate biomarker for CLD and may facilitate clinical uh, decisions and can help tracking the e efficacy of uh, therapeutic approaches. So with this, I would like to come to the end and acknowledge. Uh, so this is our department, the people of our department, uh, the last picture before COVID-19. Uh, so mainly involved, it was Isabel Weinhofer and uh, Bettina Zierfuss and Sonja Forsbetta. Uh, and of course it was funded by ELA and it would not have been possible without the cooperation uh, with uh, Florian Eichler, Wolfgang Köhler and Patrick Obur. And uh, thank you again for the funding by ELA and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks Johannes, um, very exciting. In particular as this is a challenge how to distinguish um, boys who um, have cerebral ALD lesions that are active versus those that are possibly halted. And uh, so I think this is going to be important to monitor disease. So um, as next uh, speaker, we have uh, Stefan Kemp uh, from Amsterdam. And um, Stefan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Feel free to share screen. Yes, I will. Um, this is not the right one, I think. I think you see my presenter now. Yes. Uh, the whole, the, yeah, you see presenting view, I think. So I will share the uh, gather desktop. Um, and of course it jumps. <laughs> so yeah, I can, I can just start by speaking. Uh, I also would like to thank Ayla for the opportunity to present a work that is uh, largely um, uh, sponsored by ELA, 
uh, two grants, actually. Um, can you see the presenting uh, slides now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so the topic is uh, metabolic rerouting of ferrum chain fatty acids and its effect on adrenal leukodystrophy. Um, I also have disclosures. Uh, so I received grants from uh, several companies and I am a consultant for a few uh, from, uh, companies. Uh, but that does not affect the work I'm presenting here. Um, yeah, I uh, just swapped my, swapped my, uh, my slides because I, uh, I would like to start off with uh, basically the end. This, the work that I will present at this presentation has just been published uh, two weeks ago in the Journal of Clinical Investigations. Uh, and as I said, this work is also, uh, as a result, a big thank to ELA. Without ELA, this would not have, uh, have this work would not have been carried out. And it's published uh, under open access. So you, you, everybody can, um, can download this, this work for free and, and read it. Uh, but uh, I can imagine that it's, it's rather complicated, the, uh, the content. So I'd like to give you a helicopter view of, of the work uh, in this study. And it, it's, the study involves uh, three disease models. The zebrafish model that Josh Bonkowski uh, has just mentioned. Uh, skin cells from ALD patients, which are extremely important in our ALD research and, and also diagnostics, and the ALD knockout mouse. Uh, yes, great. Uh, okay, ALD is uh, characterized by mutations in the ABCD1 gene, and all patients have elevated levels of varum chain fatty acids. Uh, and mainly C26 fatty acids. And this is, being, this is important for diagnosing this disease. Uh, so, um, and this is due to effect in the ABCD1 gene that has already been, been told. And uh, as a consequence of the mutation in this, this gene, there is a defect in the AOD transporter. And this is a key transporter for ferrum chain fatty acids into the peroxisomes where they are uh, being broken down. And these fatty acids there are, do not come from the diet. We produce these fatty acids ourselves in our cells. And in order to maintain the balance between synthesis of fatty acids and breakdown of fatty acids, the ALD uh, protein is very important. So if there's a defect in the ALD protein, this whole system is, is, uh, is out of balance and you get uh, excess amounts of fatty acids. And these are stored in tissues and they eventually lead to disease. Um, but as mentioned already in previous talks, uh, it, it, the complex, it is a very comp complex clinical spectrum of ALD. So patients uh, all have uh, mutations in the ABCD1 gene and the elevated fatty acids, and that uh, can be used in order for uh, doing newborn screening. But we cannot predict the clinical outcome. So patients, uh, uh, mills can develop uh, adrenal insufficiencies, which can start as early as six months of age, but also uh, in adulthood. Um, three out of uh, 30, uh, one out of, no, 30% <laughs> uh, of boys are at risk to develop cerebral ALD uh, before the age of 10 years. And in adulthood, all men and, and almost all females develop a spinal cord disease. And for adrenal insufficiency, there's treatment for hormone replacement therapy. For cerebral ALD, if it's caught in time, uh, there, uh, this can be treated with a bone marrow transplant. But for ma the majority of patients, those that develop the spinal cord disease, also the females and the males, there is no therapy. Uh, and in, uh, in addition, uh, work that we have done in Amsterdam, uh, because there were there were we there were questions uh, that uh, from patients and also from students uh, asking that uh, so does the BOMO transplant that prevents uh, or that uh, curates the the cerebral ALD does it prevent patients from developing spinal cord disease? So we uh, we looked at the uh, clinical symptoms in uh, boys that are were now men that were treated in the 90s for cerebral ALD. 
and for the onset of uh, spinal cord disease. And it turned out that at the time of, of, of uh, investigation, three out of these five uh, patients had developed myelopathy in adulthood. So the conclusion is, is that the bone marrow transplant does stop the inflammatory component in the brain of the disease, but it, uh, it does not correct the biochemical defect. It's recently been shown also in a Japanese paper in, uh, in mice. Um, and that is, of course, has consequences. So the hypothesis that we uh, are investigating is that the spinal cord disease is caused by a chronic toxicity of these fatty acids. So in order to develop a, tre a tre therapy for the man and the female developing this spinal cord disease, we uh, are aiming up uh, on uh, preventing the toxicity of these fatty acids. And there are uh, different ways you can do that. And our focus would be on uh, lowering the fatty acids in, this, in, this uh, in the spinal cord. And preferably, of course, also in the brain. And for that, we have set up an essay, a screening essay. And that's based on uh, an observation that we did years ago. And uh, that's shown on these, on these images here. So if you culture skin cells from controls uh, in, in a dish and you can stain them with all kinds of colors. And here, in this case, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, green. And you add fatty acids to the tissue culture medium, you see that there is no effect. The cells are happy and they grow. However, if you do this for ALD cells, and you look after a, a week or two weeks, you see that there are way less cells than when you started off. This means that these, these cells, they have died. They, they, they disappeared. And that's caused because of, of the fatty acids. And this finding uh, allowed us to set up a screening assay just based on uh, cells dying or not dying. And that's shown here. So this is a, a, a 96 Walsh plate and all these, these little circus that, uh, circles that contain cells. Uh, if you, if you, and you can stain uh, the tissue culture medium with a dye and uh, the color of the dye indicates the number of cells that are there. So if, there, if we uh, add no fatty acids to ALD cells, you can see that they grow and uh, the, the medium uh, stains dark red, indicating that there are a lot of cells there. So if we add fatty acids to these ALD cells, they die and, and the medium uh, stains yellow. And uh, as a control, we have used control cells with this fatty acids and they don't, don't care about these fatty acids, they grow and they stain a dark, dark red. So this is basically almost a binary screening. The, the cells are there or they're not there. So what we did, we, uh, we, we added uh, uh, a library of small molecules and we just uh, looked at the effect on, uh, on these cells growing. And this is uh, two, two of these dishes with, with cells. And we, we screened the Prestwick library, which is a, a library of uh, almost 1300 different small molecules. And you can see there that there are some, uh, uh, some molecules that rescue these, uh, the ALD cells from dying. Um, um, so that's all very nice. Uh, and then something happened, and uh, George also uh, mentioned it uh, when he said, when he thanked Ayla uh, for one of the important things is bringing scientists together. And uh, so a few years ago, we talked about this. And uh, then it turned out that in the meantime, when we were doing this, these essays, that Josh had done a similar thing with his uh, zebrafish in Utah. Uh, so he already talked about the fish, which uh, are uh, really nice because they develop a, a spinal cord disease and, um, and which you can track by this, this very cool monitoring of the fish and their, sw their swimming behavior. Um, so what Josh did, his, uh, his group screened uh, almost uh, over 2,500 different compounds. And, um, and out of these 2,500, 74 compounds improved the uh, behavior of these fish in five different domains. The distance the, the fish swam, the, the velocity, uh, the time they spent moving, and how active these, these fish were. Uh, they selected the, the, the 18 best compounds and did a rescreening with different concentrations and the different uh, ages of these fish. And it turned out that the top con uh, compound they identified was chloroquine. If you treat uh, these fish with chloroquine, 
uh, you see an improvement in uh, the time they move and the distance they swim. And I was interested because when we uh, talked about this, uh, we looked in our data and it turned out that one of these molecules that we had uh, identified as rescuing uh, LD for fatty acid toxicity in LD cells was also chloroquine. And of course, then the question is what happens? Uh, how, does it, uh, how does chloroquine prevent cell death in AOD cells and restore swimming behavior in AOD fish? Uh, and in Amsterdam, we have uh, set up uh, ways to measure fatty acid synthesis, because I told you the, these fatty acids do not come from the diet. We produce them ourselves. And we have a la a stable isotope labeled fatty acids that we can give to tissue culture cells. And then we leave the cells in the tissue culture medium uh, for, for several days, and then we can measure what happened with this fatty acid. So in this case, we give uh, the cell C16, which is a long chain fatty acid. And in the cell, this is elongated to A to C18, C20, C22, C24, and C26. And the C26 is the toxic compound. And here we just asked what happens if we treat cells with chloroquine and we uh, analyze the amount of C26 that is being formed in these cells. As you can see, there, if we do not add chloroquine, uh, this is the amount of, of uh, fatty acid that ALD sells, and it's increased over controls because in green, on all my slides, the greens are uh, the control cells and the blue are the ALD cells. So, uh, so this is the effect that, uh, of the absence of ALD protein, and if you add chloroquine, you see a reduction. Um, and what we also saw, because if we add C16, we not, do not just measure these fatty acids, but we also measure the fatty acids in which there is a double bond in the fatty acid side chain. So and this, this enzyme here, SCD1, that, uh, that, add, uh, that adds a double bond to a C18. So it makes from C18 zero, it makes C181. And this C181 is further elongated also to long long chain fatty acids. And we noticed that there is an increase, uh, a modest increase in the amount of C18, one that is being formed out of the, uh, when we give C16 zero. Um, I just mentioned here, SED1 is, is the key enzyme that regulates this, this process going from a, a saturated fatty acid to a monounsaturated fatty acids. And our results, uh, our experience, uh, Experiments have already uh, shown that these uh, saturated fatty acids are very toxic. Uh, they, uh, the cells kill, uh, uh, it kills uh, ALD cells. But uh, our work had already also shown that uh, these monounsaturated fatty acids, so a C26 with just a double bond, uh, which are referred to as monounsaturated fatty acids, these are not toxic. Uh, then we went in the literature looking for, because chloroquine is, is nice, but it's, it's not, it, its effect was not that, that, uh, that, that big. And then we identified this compound, TO191317, and I will abbreviate it as TO. Uh, so we identified this compound TO, which is an LXR agonist, and I won't go into uh, what an LXR agonist is. Uh, and, but, if you read the title of this, this paper, it's very interesting because it mentions a compound and it upregulates SCD1. And that's exactly what we were looking for. So we, uh, we, we ordered this TO compound and we uh, gave it to uh, control cells and ALD cells in the tissue culture medium. And then we measured the amount of SCD1 protein. And if there is no TO, uh, either in control or in ALD cells, there is uh, just a little bit of SCD1, and if we add the TO compound, or, uh, both in control and in LD cells, there is a nice increase in the amount of SCD1. And okay, this is an LXR agonist, so there are more LXR agonists. So the question for us was, is this, is this an LXR activity or is it specific for TO? No, it's an LXR um, effect uh, because other LXR agonists do also do this. In the paper, we have uh, we have used all these electro organisms, but for the sake of uh, simplicity in the presentation and clarity in the presentation, I uh, took out all the uh, all the other electro uh, information from the pr uh, presentation from the figures, and I just focused for the rest on TO. 
So, uh, okay, so there are several essays that we did. Uh, we looked at the activity of uh, TO on SCD1, desaturated activity. And here we gave the cells uh, 18 0, so 18 0. And, uh, and SCD1 makes us into a C18 1. And that we, we see here. So if we, uh, if we don't have TO, there's a little bit of uh, 18 one and, and it's a nice increase both in controls and in LD cells in the amount of C18-1 that's been formed. Um, we also looked uh, on the uh, synthesis of C16, uh, C26 out of C16 again, the, what I showed with chloroquine, but now we do it for the TO compound. So we give C16 to the cells and we, uh, after a few days, we look at the amount of C26 that's being formed. Here we again see the effect, the effect in LD cells. They have enhanced elongation of C16 to C26. And if we add TO, there's a complete normalization. So now you cannot distinguish ALD cells anymore from controls, which is really nice. Uh, that's uh, indicating that this is a really spectacular effect. And of course, what we would expect is that the C16 now is not, is not generated into C26-0 anymore, but we expect it to be a C26-1. And that's exactly what, what we see. Here we see an increase in C26-1 in ALD cells. So, it, it seems to work. So you give C16, zero, uh, SCD1, it, there's more SCD1 in the cell, it converts it to C181, uh, and then it, this is for the elongated to, to C261. Uh, Stefan, you, you have to wrap up. Huh? Yeah, okay. So uh, it also normalizes fatty acids in, in the cell when we do a chronic uh, um, treatment. And this one, okay, I will skip. And then, of course, the question is, does it also work in vivo? So we uh, had uh, normal mice and ALD mice, and we put them on the placebo or on the TO compound in their diet uh, for five and 10 weeks. And then we looked at the C26 levels in LD uh, organs. And this was done together with Johannes Berger. So when we looked in the brain after 10 weeks uh, in the spinal cord and the adrenals, in the brain, we saw a 20% reduction in the spinal cord, a 20% reduction in the adrenals, a 20, uh, 60 uh, to 55% reduction. Can you just uh, take this, this compound? Uh, no, you can't because there is uh, side effects. Uh, there's liver toxicity, uh, ballooning, steatose, and infl inflammation. So that comes to my last slide, my conclusion slide. Uh, well, the zebrafish are very cool to study uh, all kinds of uh, AOD related things. Uh, and yes, SED1 is an, uh, if you activate SED1, it has a, a beneficial effect on the biochemistry. Uh, you, but you cannot uh, just take chloroquine or the alexoarganist because they have adverse side effects. So, what we really want to do now is identify more specific SED1 activators because safety is key because for LD, it's a chronic disease. So you need long-term treatment uh, to see a beneficial effect. And this is everybody that is involved in this work. Um, and then the final slide is the ALD group in Amsterdam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan, very exciting. So clearly this is opening a new uh, door in, in the field of ALD with new treatments to come in the next uh, decade for sure. Um, next speaker will be Caroline Sevin um, and uh, uh, coming to us from Paris. Thanks so much, Caroline. Please uh, share your slides. Je partage mon écran. Vous m'entendez? Vous voyez? C'est bon? Est-ce que vous m'entendez ou pas Vous pouvez repartager votre écran
Oui, j'essaye, mais j'ai l'impression d'être... Vous m'entendez là ou pas Oui, oui, on vous entend sur le coup. D'accord. C'est bon là C'est parfait. D'accord. Donc, je vais vous présenter quelque chose qui... Euh, une présentation qui va être plus simple et, et probablement plus euh, pragmatique que tout ce que vous avez pu... Euh, entendre dans les présentations précédentes avec toutes ces avancées absolument incroyables qui sont faites dans la, dans la recherche et qui, qui vont nous aider clairement à, à développer et avancer pour le, le traitement de, de cette maladie qui est la grénoleucodystrophie. Je vous rappelle juste, tout, beaucoup de choses ont déjà été dites, donc ce qui va rendre ma, ma présentation plus courte et donc je vais rentrer dans les, dans les 15 minutes que les organisateurs ne s'inquiètent pas. Donc, l'adrénoleucodystrophie liée à l'X, c'est la plus fréquente des leucodystrophies héréditaires. C'est euh, un, une maladie qui est liée à l'X et qui est liée aux, aux mutations d'un gène ABCD1 qui entraîne un défaut d'oxydation des acides gras très longue chaîne. Donc, le marqueur de la maladie qui est très simple à, à doser, c'est les acides gras très longue chaîne. Il est très sensible, il est augmenté chez 100% des hommes et il est augmenté chez 75 à 80% des femmes qui sont porteuses de la mutation. C'est une maladie qui touche le cerveau et la moelle épinière principalement, mais également les surrénales et les testicules. Comme vous l'avez déjà entendu, il y a plusieurs formes de la maladie. Il y a la forme qui est la, 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 cette adrénoleucodystrophie cérébrale de, de l'enfant qui touche le garçon entre 5 et 12 ans, euh, qui est une leucodystrophie euh, très très euh, rapidement progressive et inflammatoire. Euh, elle, a, elle a vraiment ce caractère inflammatoire qui la, qui la caractérise et qui fait que d'ailleurs euh, on a une, un, un traitement euh, possible qui est la greffe de, de moelle osseuse. La forme de l'adulte qui touche les hommes, mais qui touche également les femmes porteuses de la mutation, c'est l'adrénomyéloneuropathie qui touche la moelle et les nerfs périphériques. Et quand on a une adrénomyéloneuropathie, qu'on est un homme, on a aussi un risque de développer une atteinte cérébrale de la maladie qui ressemble finalement à celle de l'enfant. Elle est un petit peu différente, mais elle est aussi très, très sévère et rapidement évolutive. Et puis, il y a des formes qui sont limitées juste à une insuffisance surrénale, qui est un moyen de dépister aussi cette maladie. Mais on sait que ces formes-là vont évoluer vers une, vers une ALD cérébrale ou une AMN. Un, un homme ne garde jamais toute sa vie uniquement une insuffisance surrénale. Donc vous voyez, il y a un continuum de sévérité. Mais euh, les messages, c'est que finalement, quand on est avec une, une mutation du gène ALD, on a euh, 50 à 60 de risque de développer dans l'enfance ou l'âge adulte une forme cérébrale de la maladie. Et le deuxième message, mais ça il a bien été euh, exprimé, c'est que tous les hommes euh, porteurs de la mutation vont développer une, une forme médulaire de la maladie, mais également euh, près plus de trois, trois quarts des, des femmes qui euh, sont conductrices. La LD cérébrale de l'enfant, euh, on, on en a aussi un petit peu parlé. Les, les messages que je, je, je voudrais passer sur cette forme de l'enfant, c'est que la, le retard au diagnostic de cette maladie fait que, dans la majorité des cas, quand on a un premier enfant, un premier, ce qu'on appelle un cas index, c'est-à-dire le premier enfant dans une famille chez qui on fait le diagnostic d'adrénoleucodystrophie, c'est un, sta, un stade où, malheureusement, il n'y a pas de traitement possible. Pourquoi Parce que le début est très, très insidieux. Et le début... Donc, je vous ai dit, c'est la tranche 6-12 ans, mais il y a un pic vers 6-8 ans. Donc, c'est souvent l'entrée au CP euh, avec des petites difficultés scolaires qui apparaissent, des petits troubles comportementaux, des petits troubles d'attention. Et, et ces enfants, le plus souvent, sont diagnostiqués comme des troubles déficitaires de l'attention. Et il y a une, une phase qui dure 12 à 18 mois où finalement, le diagnostic n'est pas fait. Et malheureusement, c'est cette phase-là où le traitement est encore possible. Et puis, à un moment donné, sans compte, connaissent exactement le, le facteur déclenchant, mais on sait que c'est ce caractère inflammatoire qui arrive et tout d'un coup, il y a une, une, une inflammation très sévère qui entraîne une diffusion, une, une extension très rapide des lésions, des lésions et qui, et qui s'accompagne d'une régression rapide sur le plan moteur et sur le plan cognitif qui se fait sur, sur un ou deux ans. 
Alors, ce topo était, et le but de ce topo, c'est de présenter un, un, un traitement qui est en cours d'essai clinique, mais pour le présenter, je, je, je voulais aussi passer ces messages. C'est excessivement important de dépister dans une famille, quand on a un cas index, tous les hommes et tous les enfants et toutes les femmes qui potentiellement sont porteurs de la mutation. On n'a aucune corrélation entre la mutation et l'évolution de la maladie. Dans une même famille, on peut avoir toutes les formes de la maladie. Il n'y a pas de marqueur biologique, même si on a vu des résultats encourageants avec le, le neurofilament dans un, un, une présentation précédente. Donc ça, c'est vraiment un grand, un grand espoir. Mais aujourd'hui, on n'a pas de moyen qui permet de dire, quand on a une mutation et qu'on est un garçon, est-ce qu'on va faire une, une ALD cérébrale de l'enfant Est-ce qu'on va faire une AMN Est-ce qu'on va faire une ALD cérébrale de l'adulte Donc c'est excessivement important de faire le screening familial exhaustif pour, chez la femme, détecter des femmes conductrices qui peuvent développer des signes d'AMN et qui, euh, évidemment, euh, si euh, elles sont enceintes, peuvent donner naissance à des garçons atteints. Chez les hommes, asymptomatiques, c'est excessivement important de les dépister également, que ce soit des enfants ou des adultes, parce qu'ils peuvent développer une forme cérébrale de la maladie, parce qu'ils peuvent, quand ils sont adultes, développer des signes d'AMN et parce qu'ils peuvent développer une, une insuffisance surrénale. Donc, comment on fait le, le suivi En fait, on fait le suivi, le seul moyen de le faire quand on a dépisté un garçon qui, a, pas, qui a la mutation mais qui n'a pas de, de symptômes, on va faire des IRM cérébrales répétées euh, tous les six mois pendant l'enfance, puis tous les ans. Euh, et sur, le but, c'est de détecter une toute petite lésion avec une toute petite inflammation. Et à ce moment-là, on a euh, un traitement qui est possible. Il faut évidemment aussi surveiller la, la, le bilan surrénalien parce que, bien sûr, ce n'est pas la composante majeure de la maladie, mais l'insuffisance surrénalienne, c'est quelque chose qui peut entraîner des signes sévères chez l'enfant comme chez l'adulte, donc il faut absolument la dépester. Et puis, chez les hommes et les femmes conductrices, il faut également dépister les signes d'AMN parce que, vous l'aurez compris, il y a des traitements qui sont en approche de développement pour ces, cette forme adulte de la, de la maladie. Euh, je vais passer cette diapositive parce que vous avez eu beaucoup de, 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 de renseignements sur la, sur la physiopathologie de la maladie. Pour vous rappeler donc que l'adrénoleucodystrophie, contrairement à la, quasiment toutes les autres leucodystrophies, est une leucodystrophie traitable, mais pour être traitée, il faut que le traitement soit, soit réalisé très très tôt, comme je vous l'ai dit, quand il y a une toute petite lésion, et dans ce cas-là, la greffe de cellules sous schématopoïétiques ou la thérapie génique ex vivo peuvent permettre de stabiliser les lésions de démyélinisation. Le problème, c'est qu'il y a un délai d'action qui est de, de un an, un an et demi. Et donc, pendant ce temps, on peut quand même avoir une, une progression de la, de la maladie. Donc maintenant, je vais vous parler de euh, l'alérigliazone, qui est un, 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 un médicament qui est actuellement en cours d'évaluation dans l'ALD cérébrale de l'enfant, mais aussi, et vous le verrez dans la présentation suivante, dans l'AMN, dans la forme adulte d'ALD. Ce médicament, un, un, il s'appelle MIN-102, il est développé par le, le laboratoire Minorix Therapeutics. C'est un activateur du récepteur PEPAR-GAMMA. Ce récepteur il est impliqué dans de nombreuses voies métaboliques, vous voyez sur ce, ce schéma à droite, et vous voyez que il est impliqué dans des composantes euh, qui sont euh, affectées dans, dans, la, dans la LD, l'inflammation, le stress oxydatif, les, la dysfonction des mitochondries, la mort neuronale ou la dégénérescence neuronale. Et donc, il a plusieurs actions thérapeutiques potentielles dans l'adrénoleucodystrophie, mais aussi dans d'autres maladies euh, neurodégénératives. Et... Euh, c'est un métabolite d'un autre composé qui s'appelle la bioglitazone, qui est un, un vieil antidiabétique oral qui, qui a été utilisé très très longtemps et dans, le, dans, le, dans le diabète et qui a, euh, été, euh, qui a montré un effet positif dans le modèle murin de l'adrénoleucodystrophie. C'est un papier qui avait été euh, publié il y a, en, en 2013 par l'équipe d'Aurora Pujol et ils ont montré que chez la souris ALD qui finalement présente un phénotype d'AMN en fait, hein, ces souris-là, elles ont plus une AMN, elles n'ont pas de problème de démyélinisation au niveau cérébral et donc ils ont montré qu'il y avait un effet positif de ce traitement sur euh, la biogénèse de la mitochondrie, le métabolisme énergétique, le stress oxydatif 
que ce médicament permettait d'améliorer les anomalies motrices et les anomalies et les dommages axonaux chez la souris ALD. Et ça a conduit à un essai clinique euh, conduit par, par Aurora Pujol. Le, le, le léryglitazone a, par rapport à la, à la pioglitazone, semble-t-il, une meilleure pénétration dans le système nerveux après administration orale. Donc, c'est la raison pour laquelle le, le laboratoire Minorix a développé cette, cette molécule avec un très bon pro, 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 profil de tolérance. Et il est actuellement en cours d'évaluation dans la taxique Friedreich et dans l'adrénomyéloneuropathie. La, dans Ce sera l'objet de la présentation suivante, donc je ne vais pas en parler du tout. Et donc, sur la base de, de les, les potentiels effets de ce médicament sur la neuroinflammation, sur, je vais vous montrer sur la diapositive, sur la neuroinflammation, sur le stress optivatif, sur les dysfonctions de la mitochondrie sur la dégénérescence axonale et également, semble-t-il, sur la possibilité de favoriser un certain degré de remyélinisation, ce médicament a été, donc, est en cours d'évaluation dans la LD cérébrale de l'enfant. C'est un protocole qui s'appelle le protocole Nexus. Cet essai, c'est un été multicentrique qui se fait sur six sites en Europe et aux États-Unis. Il y a un centre qui est ouvert à l'hôpital Bicêtre depuis juillet 2020. C'est une étude ouverte de phase 2 et qui va inclure donc 13 enfants, qui sont des enfants qui seront âgés entre 2 et 12 ans et qui seront des enfants avec une ALD cérébrale débutante. C'est-à-dire que ce ne, sera pas des enfants, ce ne seront pas des enfants avec des lésions avancées d'adrénoleucodystrophie, mais finalement des enfants qui sont dans des indications d'une de, greffe, c'est-à-dire un score de démyélinisation, ce qu'on appelle le score de l'os inférieur ou égal à 10. L'absence ou la présence d'une inflammation qui est caractérisée par la présence de gadolinium après injection intraveineuse, quand on injecte de, du gadolinium en injection intraveineuse et qu'on regarde s'il pénètre dans le cerveau sur l'IRM cérébral, si on voit du gadolinium dans le cerveau, ça veut dire que la barrière hémato-encéphalique est rompue et ça veut dire qu'il y a une, une inflammation. Donc, les enfants qui vont recevoir ce traitement pourront soit avoir un, une petite inflammation, soit pas d'inflammation. Il doit y avoir une absence de signes majeurs fonctionnels neurologiques et euh, il y a des critères d'exclusion, en particulier le diabète, euh, l'existence de problèmes cardiaques, le fait qu'on ait déjà reçu, que l'enfant ait déjà reçu une greffe de, de cellules souches hématopoïétiques ou euh, un autre traitement expérimental, l'existence d'une autre pathologie neurologique qui, peuvent, qui pourrait euh, influer sur les, sur les résultats et d'autres critères plus habituels comme l'absence de, de, de maladies hépatiques, rénales, etc., qui contre-indique le traitement et l'inclusion dans l'essai. Le, dans L'objectif principal, vous l'aurez compris, en fait, on va donc donner ce médicament à des enfants qui ont une lésion toute débutante d'adrénoleucodystrophie avec ou sans inflammation. Le but principal, c'est d'essayer de prévenir quand elle n'existe pas ou d'atténuer quand elle existe l'inflammation et la démyélinisation. Donc, d'arrêter la progression de la maladie et, dans l'idéal, d'éviter la nécessité d'une greffe de cellules souches hématopoïétiques. Donc, c'est dans, dans cet objectif que le traitement est donné. Cet, cet effet, il sera évalué à 24 et 96 semaines et les critères d'efficacité, ça va être l'absence d'apparition de signes majeurs neurologiques fonctionnels une absence d'apparition quand l'enfant n'en a pas au moment de l'inclusion ou une diminution de la prise de gadolinium témoignant de l'inflammation et une absence de progression des lésions de démyélinisation. Il y a des objectifs secondaires d'imagerie et de, et de biomarqueurs comme vous avez pu en entendre, en l'entendre avec des méthodes que vous, dont on vous a parlé dans les, dans les, dans les présentations précédentes. Euh, 
Comment est-ce que ça se passe le protocole de manière très pratique C'est un protocole qui est relativement euh, simple. Donc, il y a une visite de screening pour voir si le patient remplit, l'enfant remplit les, les conditions pour recevoir le traitement. Et puis après, il y a des euh, visites dont une partie peuvent une, une partie de ces visites, c'est principalement pour la, la sécurité, la, ce qu'on appelle la safety, et elles peuvent se faire à domicile avec une infirmière qui vient faire les prises de sang et euh, les électrocardiogrammes et qui prend quelques, quelques renseignements sur l'absence d'effets indésirables, etc. Et puis, il y a des visites qui doivent se faire sur le site où il y a à ce moment-là un examen clinique, des scores neurologiques et, et euh, des IRM cérébrales. Ces visites se font euh, tout, tous les trois mois, alors que les bilans biologiques sont, sont plus fréquents. Oh, pardon. Donc, euh, nous, on a, on a pour le moment euh, à Paris donc, inclus trois enfants, mais sur des périodes pour l'instant assez courtes, hein, puisque le, le, le premier enfant a été inclus à la fin de l'année dernière, il n'y a, il a, il a, il a même pas six mois. Euh, donc, ce qu'on peut dire, c'est que globalement, vous verrez après chez le, dans l'essai de l'adulte le, le, quels sont éventuellement les effets indésirables qui peuvent être tout à fait différents chez l'enfant. Nous, on n'a pas eu de problème particulier. Donc, on peut traiter des, des, essayer de, de traiter des enfants avec ce traitement. C'est vraiment, bien sûr, j'ai euh, aucun renseignement sur les résultats et l'efficacité, puisque par définition, c'est le but de ce, de ce protocole. Mais si on a un effet positif, clairement, euh, ça peut être une, une alternative ou une aide euh, au moment où on doit discuter d'une grève de cellules souches ou de la thérapie génique chez des enfants qui ont des toutes petites lésions débutantes. Voilà, je vous remercie et je ne sais pas si, je pense que des questions sont à la fin si vous en avez. Je laisse la parole à, à, à Volcan Colère qui va vous parler lui de l'essai de la, de la, de chez l'adulte. Merci bien, Caroline. Merci. <laughs> um, yes, there will be questions, so we want to move, move uh, forward. Uh, next speaker will be Wolfgang Kühler from Leipzig. Wolfgang. Yeah, uh, first of all, I would really like to uh, thank um, the ELA for uh, this invitation and the support for all the years. So, um, Back in 2019, uh, at this meeting, um, a company called Minerix um, proposed a new molecule for the treatment for AMN. So uh, now, three years later, uh, we are facing results from a first international cooperation uh, in a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multi-center trial in AMN patients. So what, what does it mean? Randomized is, um, well, people are um, <clears throat> chosen by chance or selected by chance to get either the treatment uh, or a placebo. So this is important that uh, one group of the patients didn't get the real drug for about two years. And double blind means that neither the investigator nor the probant uh, knows what he gets for this certain period of time. So this is important to understand how we uh, want to know if a drug is really working, yes or no. Well, this drug is um, targeting um, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, uh, neuroinflammation, demyelination and axonal degeneration, which occurs in ALD, and you already heard a lot about these uh, aspects uh, that are present in this disease. Well, 
uh, our goal, for example, in this the in this uh, uh, treatment in this trial is uh, to counteract the cellular dysfunction and finally preventing neurodegeneration. Well, this is a, an international study. Many um, many study centers from Europe and the U.S. are participating. And they're really happy that we really had a very good cooperation within this study supported by Minorix. So the patients are randomized in a two to one randomization. So uh, two third get the, the drug right from the beginning and one third of the patients uh, get the placebo for 90, <clears throat> for 96 weeks the treatment duration was 96 weeks after a screening phase and followed by an extension so all in all 160 patients were randomized um, and uh, so uh, what are the inclusion criteria so we um, AMN patients with, with a uh, confirmed diagnosis uh, in a certain age period from 18 to 65 years were included. Uh, they should have some, ki some, um, some disability, um, but not too much. They should at least be able to walk for six minutes since the main outcome measure in this study is the six minute walking test. And of course, they should be able to stand on a force plate to measure sway, body sway, which is a very important second line key outcome measure. So patients with, uh, who already had severe inflammatory brain disease were not able to uh, participate in this study. Also patients with uh, heart problems, anemia or diabetes uh, uh, could not participate in this study. So what, what are we looking for? We are of course looking for safety and efficacy. Yeah. Well, for, for, for safety reasons, of course, the patients had regular safety visits. We did some blood checks for any kinds of side effects in the blood and also MRIs on a regular basis to detect cerebral ALD as early as possible, which may then cause an additional treatment option. Of course, we wanted to know what is the effects of this uh, tr uh, of this drug. So we are looking for motor functions. How, uh, what is the ab ability to to stand or to walk? How is the muscle strength? How is spasticity going? What about the sensory functions? And of course, uh, what is the global impression? Is the drug or uh, is, is, is the patient improving or not? And this is not only uh, a, a question that we asking to the investigators, we also ask the patients from the patient's perspective, uh, what is their imp uh, uh, overall um, uh, improve, um, uh, impression if, the, if, if there's something happening with this drug? Also we're asking for quality of life, um, which is in close correlation to the clinical symptoms, for example, walking or incontinence problems. Well, to measure all these, um, uh, we, we are, as I already said, uh, looking for uh, the six minute walking test, which is the primary efficacy endpoint. Uh, this is also causing some problems, at least in, in AMN patients who have a phenotypic variability. Some patients are walking quite well. They are walking all day, for example, without any limitations, with some hesitations, some stiffness maybe. 
but other patients are barely able to walk already. So it's hard for those uh, to uh, walk for six minutes. So this is kind of a problem with coming with the six minute walking test. So we also have secondary efficacy endpoints. For example, we're looking for balance, um, measuring the body sway on a, on a, on a plate, um, computerized uh, sway measurements. We are looking for progressive myelopathy using special, special scores. Uh, measuring disability, neurological disability, and general neurological functions using the EDSS, for example. And as I already said, the clinical global impressions for severity, for improvement from the investigator, but also from the patient itself. Finally, we're also uh, measuring muscle strengths with a dynamometry and the quality of life aspects. And of course, looking at the uh, MRIs. So it's a very big uh, uh, pro uh, program that uh, is uh, trying to, to uh, find out if this drug is really helpful, yes or no. So it uh, it's, has been a, a big effort. So let's look at the results uh, and our primary outcome, which is the six minute walking test. What you see here in this graph is that, that there is a decrease in both groups in the placebo and the active groups in walking, which is a little bit, it looks a little bit less in the treatment group. If you look at all patients than in the placebo group, but if you look at this statistically, you have to uh, uh, recognize that this difference is not clinically meaningful. So the primary endpoint in this study was not met. Even though you have the uh, um, uh, impression that there is some difference. So we looked in a post hoc analysis a little bit closer uh, to this problem. And what you can see here, that depending on the, on, the, on the disease progression or the time, how long you, the patient is um, already diseased, uh, there is a constant uh, decrease in the walking ability in the six minute walking tests in the placebo group, which is the gray bars here. You see here, patients uh, that are ill for more than 20 years, more than 50 years, more than 10 years, and here more than five years. In comparison, the patients under treatment, there's no great difference independent from uh, the, the time or the duration of the disease, and also independent from the age. So it may well be true that the, uh, the effect of the drug is dependent on when you start with the treatment. Saying when you start the treatment earlier, it may be more effective than starting later on in the disease. But this is only a hypothesis because the, this is not this analysis is not intended before we started the study. So it's a secondary analysis, which is very important to see, uh, but it's not the final result. Well, the, the, the second part, for example, is the body sway. So we're measuring the body sway on, the, on a plate like this. And you can see here a patient with feet apart. And uh, you can have a body sway from backward to forward. We call AP or anterior posterior or from right to left, which we call mediolateral. Uh, and you can do that with feet apart and feet together.
So if you um, <coughs> look at um, uh, this body sway uh, with uh, eyes closed and feet apart, you, you see there is there is a difference in those who are treated versus those who are not treated. So also in in other conditions, for example, in eyes close, feet together condition, there is a, a significant difference in those who are treated with the drug versus those who are not treated. So uh, concerning the body sway, um, there, there may be really, or there is a really a sensitive, maybe clinical relevant endpoint, which is um, uh, which a drug affects positively uh, uh, over the, this two year period of time. So this is also maybe reflected by the patient's global impression uh, uh, as a change from baseline. As you can see here, that in the Lericlitazone treated group, there are patients who rated themselves as much improved or min at least minimal improved, whereas in the placebo group, there's none of these. Uh, there's only two patients or 6% that rated themselves as minimally, minimally improved. So there is a difference in the uh, patient's own global impression uh, in the treated versus the non-treated group of patients. So for the sake of time, I also uh, uh, had this slide here. So it's an overview uh, where you can see all the results. I could talk, I would say two hours more about the results that we have. It's really a lot of uh, things that we uh, have to really look at. But in summary, you can see there are uh, some effects in, especially in body sway, but also uh, other uh, effects that are significantly, uh, significantly better or better, or at least numerically better. Uh, and there's none of the criteria that we are measuring that is getting worse uh, under this treatment. However, the primary endpoint, the six minute walking test is still not significantly better. So we missed the primary endpoint in this study. <clears throat> One important aspect uh, uh, I want to mention finally, uh, uh, namely the progression of cerebral lesions. We know from the natural history, it's already said by others uh, today, that uh, quite a lot of patients, at least 20%, uh, maybe 50 or 60% um, convert from AMN to a cerebral demyelinating ALD. Uh, which is a life-threatening uh, event. Uh, and of course, uh, it would be a great success if a drug or any kind of treatment could prevent uh, such cerebral demyelinating events. So as this study is, again, not intended to look at this primary endpoint, so we are intended to look at the six minute walking test, as I said, but we still have uh, recognized that there are six patients only in the placebo arm that develop uh, gadolinium enhancing or non gadolinium enhancing or growing lesions in the brain, cerebral lesions, which is um, obviously not recognized in the treatment arm. So, and after this two year of um, placebo controlled uh, periods in the open phase, uh, all these patients who already developed some brain involvement 
also had some change in this brain involvement once they get the drug. There was no further growth of the, of the lesions. And there's also some kind of recession or resolution, even resolution of gadolinium enhancement. So this may be um, a very important issue which we need to look at in further studies. Uh, if this drug is really possible to prevent from the development of cerebral lesions. So finally, looking at the side effects, we see um, significant differences as well. So in the treatment group, we had much more patients who suffered from edema, especially in the lower extremities, feet and lower in the legs, also causing uh, weight increase because of the, the water that is in the leg. Uh, we had some problems with lacrimation and nasopharyngitis. Uh, there is more pain in the extremities than in the placebo group. There's more anemia, there's more um, influenza. Uh, some patients suffering from diarrhea and there's a little, a little bit more fatigue. So there are significant side effects with these treatments, but uh, Despite that, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, most of the patients still stay on, on the treatment during the, during the whole period of study. So they are co uh, the, the coping effect or they cope with the, the side effects. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, obviously manageable. But there are also some positive effects, uh, as I already said, uh, occurrence of uh, cerebral involvement only happens in the placebo group. There is some uh, deterioration of adrenocortical insufficiency in the placebo group. We had um, more urinary, urinary tract infections um, and more falls, for example. So. Uh, I think the side effects are moderate, but manageable. So in summary, um, I just again want to really mention that this is the first controlled clinical trial in adrenomyelin neuropathy. And this is thanks, uh, I have to thank very much to all the participating patients and the cooperating multinational study centers. We did, uh, we had no effect on the primary endpoint, unfortunately. Um, both groups, the placebo and uh, the Verum group uh, showed modest reduction in the walking distance, but post hoc uh, analysis revealed a st stronger effect in patients with shorter disease duration at baseline, indicating that early treatment may be more effective However, this hypothesis needs to be confirmed in further studies. There are positive effects uh, as seen in body sway, for example, and balance uh, in neurological functions um, uh, measured by the EDSS, uh, spinal cord functions, um, uh, resulting uh, in a better rating in clinical global impression, both from treating physicians and patients. Well, the dropout rates uh, was modestly, modestly higher in the active farm than in the placebo, uh, which is mostly driven by the mentioned uh, side effects. And finally, MRI results are very much in favor of the active treatment. Um, only patients in placebo arm showed progression of inflammatory brain lesions. Um, so uh, we are very optimistic with this uh, point. And I think um, that uh, these data really show that this could be a very step, very good step forward in the treatment of AMN. Uh, so we all hope that uh, the company will um, uh, ask for an approval of this truck and um, most likely 
we will have a, a follow-up um, kind of registry and offer this uh, medication to all patients uh, with uh, AMN. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wolfgang. Excellent. Um, yes, very exciting. And I now want to um, open the floor to uh, patients and and uh, and the audience in general to um, ask questions. You can do this by raising your hand, and then um, we will un un unmute you. So please go ahead and. Um, raise your hand if you have a question, and, um, and then Elise will assist. I see uh, Francine. Vous m'entendez? We can understand you. <laughs> Bonjour. Euh, lorsque vous êtes intervenu euh, concernant la forme de, de l'ALD chez les, les mères, enfin les femmes euh, porteuses, vous avez euh, dit qu'il existait euh, des problèmes d'équilibre et, si j'ai bien compris, des positionnements de la tête c'est exact. Euh, je voudrais euh, savoir, lorsqu'on a à côté d'autres problèmes, alors en l'occurrence, euh, dans mon cas, j'ai euh, une jambe plus courte, donc j'ai euh, un, une bascule du bassin, une scoliose, euh, j'ai euh, de l'arthrose, tassement de vertèbres. Je, euh, lorsque... En particulier, euh, je me suis mise au yoga. Euh, lors euh, des exercices d'équilibre, je, je, enfin, c'est compliqué pour moi. Mais comment savoir si c'est à mettre sur euh, mon problème euh, physique ou sur la, la maladie, on va dire Yes, it's, this is a difficult uh, question to answer, and I don't think uh, there is an uh, easy way to generalize the answer. This has to be done in close consultation with your physician, um, also your physical therapist, and uh, ideally an ALD specialist who can together help sort out whether um, there is a component that may be ALD related and whether there are, are um, other aspects uh, that are due to injuries that uh, are likely independent. Um, but I'm afraid there is no simple answer to this. Um, but there is a growing body of knowledge across uh, several centers, both in Europe, uh, in, in Germany, and the Netherlands, and France, and in the US, um, so that we might have better answers in the future. But I think right now you have to work closely with your provider and understand um, whether any aspects of uh, dysfunction, pain, disability can be explained by injuries alone or not. Does this help? So we will take uh, the next question. Please, um, uh, Cedric. Bonjour. Please go ahead.
I cannot hear you if you're speaking. Non, il y, y a un problème d'activation. Allô euh... Allô Vous m'entendez Oui. Vous m'entendez Bonjour. Euh, C'est dit pour savoir, donc j'ai donc eu la MN, donc je l'ai eu à 24 ans et aujourd'hui j'en ai 47 euh, et en fauteuil roulant euh, depuis, depuis deux ans. Et c'était pour savoir si le médicament, justement, dont vous parliez pour la MN, euh, il y avait, euh, donc, parce que je sortais des caractères de, de, de ben, je, je, j'étais, voilà, j'étais parmi les caractères d'exclusion et savoir si, quand même, avec les premiers résultats, euh, à partir du moment où on va le prendre, même une fois où, où ça a déjà été plus inflammé, euh, est-ce que le, il y a, il y a de l'espoir pour les, les effets quand même pour ceux euh, qui ne faisaient pas partie euh, de, de, des caractères d'inclusion. Voilà. Um, Wolfgang, do you want to uh, speak to this? Uh, the question is whether patients yeah. who were excluded yeah, yes, from yes, the trial um, may yeah. benefit in future. Well, um, this this is really hard to say. Um, uh, we we of we of course hope to get uh, treatments for all kinds of all phenotypes of the disease, um, and um, it, it, many thing many things are depending on the on the authorities, uh, European authorities or U.S. authorities. Uh, what what do you what do they allow us to do with this data that we have? Can we, for example, include also patients who are more advanced? Can we include patients who are not so much advanced? Um, so this is open for the discussion. Um, we actually really don't know if this is helpful. The data that we have. Um, indicate more that the treatment effect is better in early phases of the disease versus uh, later phases of the disease. So, but this is the case for all kinds of treatments and all kinds of diseases. Um, so, uh, of course, we we need that there, there is an unmet need and there's an urgent need for new treatments, especially of also for late phases. But um, in your case, for example, you're 46 years of age um, and you have still the risk, even though we are already in the wheelchair of getting a cerebral involvement. So this may also, this may be a reason if there is a drug that will prevent you from getting the cerebral involvement, to use, to, to use this drug, to utilize this drug. But I can't say if this is really possible to, to give this treatment. Thanks, Wolfgang. And I'm hoping that um, some of the uh, data from that Johannes Berger showed on neurofilm and light chain would also help um, answer some of these questions in the future. Um, So the next, uh, oh. Valentina. Pronto? Sì, buonasera. Eh, la mia domanda è, eh, ho sentito anche che si parlava uh, di uh, rimielinizzazione e um, volevo sapere se questo uh, è un processo che potrebbe anche in futuro coinvolgere le persone affette da forme più gravi e da LD cerebrale più avanzata. E poi volevo sapere se per caso le eh, nuove scoperte attraverso il Covid dei vaccini RNA e le nuove scoperte che si stanno facendo potranno in futuro aiutare anche la ricerca sulla LD.
Valentina, are you asking in particular about the last presentation, MIN-102, or, or a different drug? Caroline Servin ha parlato del MIN-102 nei uh, bambini affetti da LD. Caroline, do you want to speak to that? Je peux parler de ce que j'ai dit concernant le MIN-102 où les résultats sur le schéma que j'ai montré où il semblait y avoir un effet du traitement sur la formation, la remyélinisation, sont des résultats qui ont été obtenu en préclinique, en recherche préclinique euh, sur, sur euh, des souris, euh, des modèles animaux. Donc, euh, c'est des résultats qui, bien sûr, sont à prendre avec euh, beaucoup, beaucoup de prudence. Il euh, n'y a pas pour l'instant de certitude, en tout cas sur, sur les patients ou, ou de, de, ce, de cet effet. Après, concernant d'autres... Euh, recherches qui puissent se faire, qui se font sur la, sur la remyélinisation. Euh, il y a bien sûr des recherches qui se font. Pour le moment, c'est dans tous les cas euh, au stade de, de recherche préclinique. Et à ma connaissance, euh, il n'y a pas d'essai de, avec des, des résultats chez, chez, les, chez les patients, ou, que ce soit dans la LD ou que ce soit dans d'autres maladies euh, démyélinisantes qui montre un effet de telle ou telle approche. Donc peut-être que d'autres intervenants veulent dire plus à ce sujet. No, Caroline, I think you said that well. I think it, this points to the importance of having um, better biomarkers uh, for cerebral ALD so that we can um, also design trials for more advanced patients. Because as you mentioned, the mouse is not a good model for myelin loss, right? Because it doesn't develop frank demyelination. Um, but hopefully with the work that Johannes Berger showed uh, on developing better biomarkers, Uh, we can understand whether there's potential for remyelination um, in, in patients with advanced cerebral ALD um, without having to put them through anesthesia and MRIs. Um, and um, clearly we need, we need um, different and, and, and better trial design for that at this point. Uh, Isabel? Bonjour. Ouais. Euh, je voulais poser la question de l'exploitation de la plateforme Le Connect. Parce que je sais que nous sommes maintenant euh, 300 ou 400 personnes inscrites sur la plateforme Le Connect avec euh, finalement euh, tous les mêmes troubles, un équilibre très précaire, c'est mon cas aussi, euh, avec des symptômes de leucodystrophie euh, dont on n'arrive pas à se débarrasser. Je pense personnellement qu'il euh, y a les symptômes de leucodystrophie, c'est mon propre diagnostic, euh, mais aussi euh, des problèmes de... J'ai été opéré de trois hernies discales, donc un dos extrêmement fragile et qui a été encore beaucoup plus fragile, fragilisé au cours des deux dernières années, puisque euh, mon fils euh, Jacques-Olivier, qui nous a quittés il y a, il y a cinq mois, j'ai eu à le, à le porter, à le soulever euh, ces deux dernières années. Donc, j'ai beaucoup sollicité mon dos. Et je pense que l'ensemble des douleurs, il y a des douleurs dans les jambes, il y a les douleurs dans les pieds. Ça, c'est l'ocodystrophie. Et en plus, euh, cette semaine, j'avais l'impression d'avoir cassé le col du fémur. Et ça, ce n'est pas l'ocodystrophie. Ça, c'est le dos. 
Donc, euh, moi, ce que je voulais savoir, puisque j'avais eu échangé avec euh, Wolfgang Köhler à, à Leipzig, et qui me disait qu'il pensait cet été, au mois d'août, pouvoir sortir un, un médicament ou quelque chose euh, qu'on puisse, euh, qu puisse essayer. Parce que ça devient, ça devient urgent. Je fais trois kilomètres à pied, mais je l'ai fait avec des, des bâtons de randonnée, parce que sinon, je titube. Voilà. Et, et je pense que nous sommes... Euh, nombreuses et nombreux peut-être à être dans cette, dans cette situation. En tout cas, là maintenant, je n'ai plus, si je tombe, c'est à la force de mes bras que je me relève. Je ne peux plus me relever avec euh, une force nerveuse de mes jambes, même si je fais du renforcement musculaire, ça n'a rien à voir. Voilà, merci. Florian. Yeah. Oh, Is Isabelle, like, I, I, I feel for you and um, uh, know, knowing um, what you've gone through in the past year, uh, you, you, you've been nothing short of, of heroic, um, taking care of your son and, and um, now finding time for yourself is important. I think this is a reminder that in the I, next year, we, we should have a physiatrist to uh, join us, rehabilitation specialist in this session, because I think there's a huge need to understand um, the details of, of rehabilitation, um, also the orthopedic issues uh, that a lot of adults with ALD face. Um, and how this is impacting um, daily life. Um, so I, I, again, I think you have to look at all aspects of, of um, health and well-being, starting from with sleep and, and uh, daily activity and physical therapy. Um, I'm, I'm a little doubtful, Isabel, that there's one single drug that's going to fix all of this. Um, Karen? Hi, Florian. Nice to hear your voice. Um, I have a question uh, for Wolfgang. Uh, so I heard Yui from Minerix uh, present last weekend at the um, ALD Family Weekend in the US. Um, and I just want to check, sort of fact check what, what I've written. So um, with regards to Min 102, uh, he said that the MRIs were evaluated before the trial and some patients had existing lesions. And initially when those MRIs were checked at the end of the trial, they showed no progression, but then they had them sort of double checked. And then they thought that three patients had actually showed progression who were on the actual drug. Wolfgang, can you keep your answer short? We only have one minute left, sorry. Yeah, this, uh, well, this is um, every patient who was included in this study, study had to have an MRI at baseline, so they shouldn't have any active uh, demyelinating disease at, at baseline. Uh, and um, so this is an inclusion criteria, even though there were two patients, one in each group, that were suspected. Uh, is changes in the MRI already at baseline in the in the afterlook of the MRTs. Um, well, the, the, I, I, I mentioned all the, 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 the trial results, um, and I'm not sure um, how we can proceed with this. Uh, we all hope that we can use this medication as a first medication in all uh, AMN patients in my eyes, in women as well as in, uh, in men, but this is uh, part of the decision of the authorities. Thanks, Wolfgang. I'm afraid we have to uh, close this uh, session. 
Uh, Sylvie, if you want to email me or others, uh, please do that. Um, I want to thank all the speakers and, and attendees for participating which in, in what is clearly um, an, an exciting time in the field and, and thank them again for their talks. So appreciate, it, appreciate everybody's input. Okay. Elise? Thank you very much. The session will be now closed. Okay.